welcome to the App Fraud session of the IAS Innovation Summit. This is where you're going to learn about the true impact of ad fraud to the digital advertising industry. And we're thrilled you have joined us. And the aim is from this session, you leave as an ad fraud expert. But first of all, let's do the introductions. My name is Vic Chappell. I'm the VP Marketing and EMEA at IAS. And I'm joined by my colleague, Ashley. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Ashley Powis and I run uh, events at IAS for the EMEA region. So um, I'm looking forward to uh, walking all of you through all things ad fraud today. So we're going to start with some background information and then move on to some examples of fraud, how it impacts you, and then finally finish with what you can do. So let's kick off first of all with why ad fraud happens. So let's take that step back and look at the industry. You know, according to eMarketer, brands are spending hundreds of billions every year on digital advertising, and it's a huge investment into digital now. And I think we're all agreed <laughs> when we say that to make digital advertising campaigns successful, marketers need to ensure their investment is being used to really reach real people. Fraud shouldn't really ever be seen as an add-on. Um, ad fraud detection is key, and it's saving advertisers globally billions of dollars every year. So. Ashley, do you want to take people a bit more into the size of the market? Yeah, absolutely. And, and uh, as Vic says, it's the size of that digital advertising market that, that tempts criminals and hackers into creating more innovative ways to steal money from the ecosystem. And that payout is therefore very large. Um, fraudsters make billions from ad fraud. Um, if it wasn't illegal, you would probably see chief ad fraud officer pop up on LinkedIn. Um, but the fact is that global ad fraud is estimated to reach $100 billion by 2023, um, and that's according to Jupiter Research. And because that it's a problem that isn't going away anytime soon, um, if you were making these huge profits with very low effort, you, know, you probably wouldn't stop. Um, and as you say, it's the size of this market, and, and there is one common question that we would hear daily, and that is, why do fraudsters target online advertising? Um, and it, it's essentially all about scalability. And you can sort of think of it as, as a money tree. As, as soon as fraudsters can start generating traffic and start making money from that, they can then do it indefinitely. Whereas if you're um, into you know, old fashioned crime, should we say like stealing credit cards um, and that kind of fraud, you need to consistently have a good supply of cards, um, which is easier said than done. Um, Equally, if you're on the other side of the scale, as you can see on the slide, and involved in organized crime, there is a likelihood that other criminals can endanger your life, um, you know, can dob you in, that you might end up in jail. Whereas online fraudsters can work independently and cut out that massive risk. Um, even so, you shouldn't think of fraudsters as these people acting alone in their basement somewhere. Um, they are perceptive, they are organized, and they are consistently uh, innovating their methods. Um, also, ad fraud is, is prevalent because it does have that high payout and low risk, um, and that's because it falls into a bit of a grey area where it's relatively difficult to actually prosecute fraudsters. Yeah. And so, that why, why are fraudsters able to commit fraud? Well, it's since the late 2000s that we've really had this enormous data boom and content is being created online at this unprecedented rate. So, that content boom actually opens up a prep plethora of potential opportunities for brands to reach their audiences, which means it's also opening up opportunities for fraudsters to operate in. So let's put those opportunities or the scale of content being created into terms that I think we all understand, which by, by which I mean Instagram posts. Um, you can see here just how lucrative this space is for fraudsters and how much potential there is because we are creating and consuming more data than ever before. So every single minute, there are many opportunities for fraudsters to take advantage. And we don't really think about that when we're posting that perfectly poached egg on, on social. Um, and, and in order to keep up with, with all this technology, obviously has to keep pace with that data creation to, to achieve reliable precision at scale. Um, on the slide now, you can see a forecast that was made by the IDC that by 2025, um, we will have created 163 zettabytes, or zettabytes of data. Um, to put that into sort of a very big perspective, um, that's four times more than every word ever spoken in human history. And what all that means for, for fraud is that past solutions to tackle um, fraud relied on human-based rules. So humans would set specific rules um, that the tech would then follow. 
And that had worked relatively well, but humans can only handle so much data, whereas solutions um, that take a sophisticated approach uh, powered by artificial intelligence and machine learning are able to scale with that rate at which the content is being created. So that's why it is vital to power your digital campaigns using machine learning technology that is more precise and more accurate than ever before. Um, the tech needs to be accurate because fraudsters and the illegal bots that they create are becoming more sophisticated in tandem. So with all this in mind, I'd imagine that most of you, unless we have some fraudsters dialing in, have never seen a bot in action. Um, so we're going to take a quick look at that and what we're actually dealing with, uh, and Vic is going to talk through it. Yeah, so what you're going to see on the screen uh, is a sandbox environment. So just for those that aren't aware, a sandbox is a controlled environment that engineers use to test tech. So in this sandbox, you're going to see the actions of a sophisticated illegal bot, and it's one that we detected and prevented advertisers against. So as you can see, this bot is operating in Internet Explorer. It's called Averine. Averine is special and sophisticated because it's mimicking that human behavior. It's moving the mouse across the page and scrolling, and you can see the mouse movement in the red heat map in the video. Here, Averine is scrolling up and down, much like a user kind of would behave on the page. It's in fact clicking through tabs uh, and other activity, which we would say is pretty typical human behavior, right? But we can tell this isn't human behavior due to the specific patterns that repeat across the tabs. You know, human beings are just not this perfect. Um, the bot then clicks the next page and the process starts all over again. So here's some fraud like really in action for you so you can see it, but you may be thinking, okay, well, is this all it is? So I think we need to kind of also start with a definition. So Ashley, do you want to define what is ad fraud? Uh, absolutely. So um, at IAS, we would define ad fraud as any deliberate activity that presents the proper delivery of ads to the intended audience uh, in the intended place. So that might seem like quite a broad definition, but um, it is because there are so many different types of fraud out there. Um, there are ongoing efforts in the ad industry to align on how we talk about fraud. So you'll often hear it referred to as invalid traffic or IBT. Um, so here are the two acronyms that you will either be very familiar with, you might have never seen them before, um, but we have GIVT or General Invalid Traffic and SIVT or Sophisticated Invalid Traffic. And these are the industry um, standards in, def in the classification of fraud. So I'm not going to read through all this slide, you'll be glad to hear, um, but I'll give you a moment to take a quick look at it um, and read what classifies under each type. But it is important to note that 70% of the invalid traffic that we see is that sophisticated traffic. And, we don't mean that it drives a Rolls Royce in that sense. It just means it's harder to detect because it does behave more like a human would. So now you know a bit more about terminology, um, we can take a quick look at what ag kind of what ad fraud actually is, um, as this can sometimes be misleading. So all of the categories on your screen now facilitate some form of fraud um, in the industry, of ad fraud in the industry. Um, and these are types of fraud that impact both publishers and advertisers. Um, and we'll be going into detail in just a couple of these um, a little bit later on. Yeah, I think it's also really important that we cover this as well. Um, this is like the flip side, what isn't ad fraud? Um, you know, ad fraud isn't the only form of verification issues that advertisers and publishers are going to face today. And it's really vital not to confuse poor quality with ad fraud. So the items on the screen here are really poor quality items rather than fraud. So I feel like now we've got that good grasp of what fraud is, how it's classified. I think it's crucial to understand that there are very different levels of sophistication when it comes to detecting um, and the accuracy of detection of ad fraud. So there are serious business implications and not only under detection of ad fraud, but also over detection, i.e. flagging everything as fraud. Um, and it impacts both sides, both the buy and the sell side of our industry, as you can see here on the screen. In essence, over-detection is limiting the opportunity to connect with a valuable audience, which could include potential buyers. So um, Ashley's going to look a little bit more at a real-life example of this type of accuracy detection. Yeah, thanks, Vic. And for, for the sake of time today, I'm just going to cover um, over-detecting, or what we'd call a false positive. Um, as we've seen a real life uh, example of this that involved IPs that were suspected of ad fraud and have been blocked. 
Um, the reason that we're focusing on this side is it's maybe not the side of fraud you'd prioritize. Um, it's understandable that you might consider under-detecting fraud as, as more detrimental. Um, but hopefully you'll see here that it's equally as important to think about um, false positives. So we, we had a report shared with us that a competitor had recorded very different ad fraud for a campaign and that the competitors were flagging real people using a public Wi-Fi um, as fraudulent activity due to the large numbers of people all using that same IP. Um, our machine learning technology based technology was uh, far more accurate in this sense and able to identify this as a genuine audience. Um, if you're an advertiser, let's say, and you miss out on this potential audience at a rate of 4x, um, that is a really big gap. And equally, as a publisher, that will be a chunky loss in revenue for something which is, is quite common. You know, a lot of people like to rinse public Wi-Fi. So kind of just to, uh, to sort of reiterate that it's, it's not just to do with what is and isn't fraud. It's about the accuracy of that technology that you are entrusting with your fraud protection. Um, that was a, a fair bit of information there, but it's just noting what's on your screen now. And these accuracy points should be on your mind when you're thinking about your fraud detection. Absolutely. So, yeah, now we're going to move into how ad fraud impacts different environments. It's a question we're often asked, you know, does fraud follow any particular patterns or focus on one specific medium? Um, well, as lovely as that would be, unfortunately, ad fraud does kind of strike pretty much anywhere at any time. Um, it's really moving where humans move, so across desktop, mobile, in-app, and, and increasingly into CTV environments. So, on your screen, you're going to see eight common forms of, oh, well, eight common forms of four patterns. So four typical of a browser and four typical of in-app. Not going to go over all of them now, but we will pick up on a couple of them, and then you can always read more about the uh, any of uh, any further ones that interest you in our complete ad fraud guide that's available to download on the IES Insider. But let's start here with looking at browser fraud pattern. So this really is the most common type of ad fraud, um, malicious bots. They really are the, the poster girl of fraud, and you may know a little about them already. So malicious bots are really programmed to compromise computer systems. It's um, effectively code that leaves your computer system open so it can be controlled remotely. And it can then be instructed to carry out actions under a user's nose. The user really wouldn't be any the wiser that their machine is infected. So Ashley, do you want to take folks through a few real examples of fraudulent bots that we've found? Absolutely. So um, Vic already spoke a little bit earlier about um, Averine. So we're going to look at its two wingmen here, um, Powerlix and Proxy8. So Powerlix, you could consider almost like the catfisher uh, of the bot world. Um, and it generates traffic to ad supported sites in order to fake human interactions. Um, to make things even trickier, it's also programmed to actually evade certain detection techniques. Um, Proxy8, on the other hand, has definitely been eating its spinach. It's a highly uh, pervasive and lucrative botnet that generates a mountain um, of fraud revenue. Uh, it uses what's called a kernel driver, a uh, kernel mode driver, which uh, in simple English means it can easily access hardware um, to achieve a really uh, high level of power that we don't really see in malware. Um, we also just want to take a really quick moment to talk about some of the newer forms of fraud that we're seeing. Um, and we recently discovered a domain spoofing bot that splices together non-existent URLs, which means that ads end up being served to pages that have never existed. Um, and we named this the, the 404 bot. So we, we found that this bot specifically exploited large ads.txt files that publishers were using that hadn't been updated or vetted. And it's worth noting here that um, ads.txt was actually a tool set up to stop fraud. Um, since our discovery, we estimate that it has affected 1.5 billion ads, so it just goes to show that these new kids on the block really do pack a punch um, and are becoming so sophisticated that they're actually exploiting tools aimed to stop them. Um, the good news is we effectively detected it, we protected our clients from it, um, and have been working with publishers in the industry to update their ads.txt files. Um, another big kind of new frontier for fraud is, is connected TV, which Vic mentioned uh, a little bit earlier. Um, and obviously this will evolve as that market grows. Um, already CTV ad spend reached $6.4 billion uh, last year um, and grew over 40%. So alongside this, um, also manufacturers are just pushing out new, stu new streaming units all the time. Having so many devices does cause issues for measurement because inevitably those new devices um, are not aligned with industry standards. 
So we've actually had this exact issue in our CTV beta, um, where we had signals from what was a legitimate streaming device um, out of Australia. But because it wasn't identified as a known device, it had to be flagged as invalid traffic. Um, we did acknowledge the problem and were able to contact that company and help them understand the standard measurement requirements um, and therefore resolve the issue. The other thing that we're, we've seen are uh, unconfirmed user agents. So publishers are releasing new apps left, right and centre. And again, when unregistered, this can cause confusion. Um, and when it's not standardised, it will be misclassified as invalid traffic. Um, it's worth noting that this isn't an exclusive list. And obviously, as CTV continues to grow, um, we'll discover more and more classifications of invalid traffic in this area. Yeah. So before we move on to like ad fraud prevention, what you can do to, to actually stop it, I wanted to focus a little bit more on like what is a real impact of ad fraud? So how detrimental can it be to individual advertiser campaigns? As we're aware, you can't really tangibly see fraud, um, but do you know the risk to your advertising spend? So we created a very simple calculator for you to be able to work out your risk cost estimate or in fact, the savings that could be made if you have a fraud detection uh, strategy in place. I put in here um, an S, just a, an annual billion impressions for an advertiser, and I put in an estimated CPM of five euros. So working to an average fraud rate of 1.8%, which in fact is quite high for Europe, where people are taking ad fraud measures, the risk to the campaign over the duration of that year will be to the tune of 90,000 euros, which is significant. So you can just see this is an example that makes it understand a lot more about what the actual risk posed to your campaign is. But as we've mentioned, ad fraud is preventable, it can be mitigated, and so that's now what we want to move on to now. Yeah, I would definitely notice if I lost 90,000 euros. <laughs> um, but let's get on to the good stuff here. So Vic, how can we actually prevent all of this doom and gloom? Yeah, so we at IS, like, we're really taking this three-pronged approach and we're seeing that as the best method. So first of all, we're looking at big data. So to the tune of 10 billion impressions every day. And we call this the behavioral network analysis. And this really helps us understand how bots behave across a multitude of web pages. So it means we're detecting patterns, anomalies. Um, you know, it's just the other solutions in market are not going to be able to have the scale to, to catch that. Um, secondly, we're using rules to validate whether or not the traffic is truly human. So our tech recognizes how different versions of different browsers should appear. We can see the browser in the code, but if the actual browser doesn't align for what we typically recognize in the code, we would know that that impression is fraudulent. And then finally, just as fraudsters can try to reverse engineer security signals from tech companies, our malware analysts can reverse engineer bots and other forms of ad fraud. So we do have a world-class threat lab and they're engaging with not only the cyber uh, cybersecurity community, but they're also infiltrating hacker communities. So effectively, they're plugging in to the dark web in order to reverse engineer fraud as much as possible. So ad fraud really is ever evolving. And at IAS, our aim is always to be learning about how ad fraud changes and develops so that we can combat it and be really that one step ahead that you need to be. So it's allowing us to take a proactive approach to discovering new threats before they emerge as widespread problems. Um, and so, yeah, we're nearly at the end of the session now, but always want to leave you with like really what are some final actions that you can take away from this. So we just got five main points here. Um, I think number one that's super important, obviously, is use verification solutions. It will confirm that your ads were delivered to the desired place and, and just make sure you're blocking um, also to protect your campaigns or spend. So secondly, use fraud solutions that have been accredited. This is really crucial and accredited for both general invalid traffic and also sophisticated invalid traffic. And Ashley, why don't you bring us home on the rest of the takeaways? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so yeah, it's also important that you ensure the agency that you work with has agreed contractual terms with publishers um, on make goods for invalid traffic just to, to keep yourself covered. Um, you should always um, be looking to use pre-bid filtering um, to avoid fraud in your programmatic buys. Um, and then finally, and unfortunately, if it's too good to be true, it probably is. 
Um, so you want to focus less on low CPMs and more on KPIs that are tailored to, to campaign goals. Um, we've gone through kind of a snapshot of this today, but for more information, including uh, a lot more kind of key takeaways, some in-depth knowledge, um, please don't forget that you can download um, our ad fraud guide on the IES Insider, and there's loads of great stuff in there. Liking the shameless plug, this is wonderful. <laughs> and, and that's really it from us and our session. We hope you have a better understanding now of how ad fraud is impacting every aspect of digital advertising, and we really hope you enjoy the rest of the IES Innovation Summit. So that's a goodbye from us. Bye.